For me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 47, Imaginative Apologetics, After Hours with Dr. Holly Ordway. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your favourite weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where Andrew, Matt and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we've worked our way through the four loves. Last month was Ecumenism Month, and we're now wrapping up Apologetics Month, where we've been examining some of Lewis's favourite apologetic arguments. And today, we're not going to examine a particular argument. Instead, we're going to talk about something a little different, imaginative apologetics. And that's why you heard the quotation at the beginning of this episode from Lewis's fantastically titled essay, Blust Bells and Flannan Spheres. And our guide to this subject is a former guest of the show, Dr. Holly Ordway. Dr. Holly Ordway is the Cardinal Francis George Fellow of Faith and Culture for Word on Fire Institute. Her writing, speaking and teaching at the Institute focuses on imaginative and literary apologetics and on the work of J.R.R. Tolkien. In addition to writing articles, essays and poems, she travels around internationally as a guest speaker. She is also a visiting professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University, and she's written a number of books. Her memoir describing her conversion to Christianity, Not God's Type, the book which we discussed on her previous appearance, Tolkien's Modern Reading, Middle Earth Beyond the Middle Ages, as well as the book which we'll be discussing today, Apologetics and the Christian Imagination, an Integrated Approach to Defending the Faith. Dr. Holly Ordway, welcome to Pints for Jack. It's lovely to be back on. <laughs> How's it going? I heard that you were in the midst of writing yet another book. Oh, yes, I am absolutely in the midst um, of a very exciting new project, which all being well will be published next year. And its working title is Tolkien's Faith, a Spiritual Biography. And that's exactly what it sets out to do, to look at what he believed, really helping readers understand what was really of central importance to him. And so therefore is very important to understanding his, his writings, his, his work overall. And oddly enough, there has been no full-on spiritual biography of Tolkien, really unpacking what he believed as a Christian, as a Catholic, um, and trying to explain it rather than just assuming that people know, what does it mean that he had a Marian devotion, or what does the Eucharist mean? Well, I want to actually explain these things and help readers of of any faith, of no faith, um, whatever their, their background, to better understand who Tolkien is by looking at his faith in, in real depth, pulling together all sorts of different um, resources and, and some new research that I've done as well. And also to provide more of an insight to him in context, because as I'm sure you've noticed, David, the English are different from Americans. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I've had the great privilege of being able to spend for you know more than 12 years now, I spend time in England every year, really living amongst the English people and in, in Oxford and getting a sense of that culture. And that has really helped me to understand Tolkien better. And I hope that I'll be able to share some of that with my readers in terms of helping them better understand how he was situated as an English Catholic and as an English Catholic in his particular time in late 19th or in 20th century, and, and thereby to just really understand him and his works better. And it's so interesting. I can't wait to share this with, with the wider world um, next year. So I'm, I'm full on writing it right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll look forward to that. Now, for this interview, I'm drinking some Yorkshire Gold tea, which I purchased thanks to a tip-off you gave me as to where I might be able to find it locally. Uh, do you have a cup of anything? I do. I am drinking also a cup of tea. Um, it's Twinings every day, uh, and it is in a William Morris mug, which is appropriate for Tolkien, since mm-hmm. he's an admirer of William Morris. <laughs> well, we are toasting Patreon supporter Emmy Stewart. Emmy, we pray that your imagination will be repeatedly renewed and baptized by good literature, and we pray that you'll be able to winsomely and imaginatively share the truth you found with all those whom you meet. Cheers. Cheers. So this past month, we've been talking about apologetics, but what is imaginative apologetics? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so apologetics, broadly speaking, is the defense of the faith, being able to make a case for why we as Christians believe what we believe. And imaginative apologetics is an approach that I and a number of my colleagues over the last few years have tried to articulate that makes use of the imagination 
to be a, an important player in this in this engagement, helping people to gain a better understanding of the faith, not just with the reason, but also with the imagination and and through the arts. And of course, this is an ancient um, approach. It's you know, and it was certainly practiced, for instance, by C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien. But in terms of being articulated as as an approach and and really put forward as a way to do apologetics, it's relatively new, but gaining a lot of, of growth, I think, and a lot of traction as people are realizing we need both. We need the reason and we need the imagination. Hmm. And so you wrote an entire book about it, Apologetics and the Christian Imagination, an Integrated Approach to Defending the Faith. And listeners will be very pleased to hear that there's lots of quotations from folks like Tolkien and Lewis. But what brought this book about? And was this actually something that was important in your own conversion to Christianity or something that you realized looking back? Well, well, both, really. Um, because, it, you know, as one of the things I talk about in my memoir, Not God's Type, is the way that literature helped me get to a point where I was willing to listen to the arguments um, about the faith. And so the imagination in literature was absolutely critically important in my own conversion. But interestingly, I wasn't aware of how important that role was until a few years after I had been a Christian. And I was reflecting more deeply on that because literature has been the world that I live in. It's been the air that I breathe, the water that I swim in, you know, since I was a child. And it took a while for me to realize, oh, that was really what was moving me forward. I went through, you know, my, my 20s being very quite, you know, angry atheist in many ways, um, a very anti-Christian. So, you know, what was it that brought me to the point where I would even take seriously these arguments, um, whereas before I wouldn't have? I would have just dismissed them. Oh, those stupid Christians. It's all a bunch of nonsense. But eventually I got to a point where I was genuinely interested in, in hearing those arguments. And it was really Lewis and Tolkien and the Christian poets who brought me to that point because I loved their work, admired it, and realized that their Christianity couldn't be compartmentalized. Um, in a nice, tidy way, it was informing the very things that I so loved. So that was the, you know, the spark for me. So, well, what did they believe? But the reason I was able to take that seriously was that by that point, imaginatively, they had showed me a vision of the world through the Christian view that was beautiful, that was meaningful, that I was interested in, that I found compelling. And that was what made me willing to say, well, what do they believe? Uh, and so it was really important in my own in my own conversion. And then, you know, as a Christian, starting to develop, you know, what, how can I share the faith? How can I do my bit? Realizing that my whole background, you know, English professor, um, leads me to want to use literature and the arts to to share the faith. And so I began sort of developing. Um, kind of developing a vocabulary, developing an approach of how do I use literature to, to share this? And then I had a pivotal moment when I read um, Malcolm Geith's book, Faith, Hope, and Poetry, um, when it came out, actually in 2008, um, and I met him. And it was interesting because later, in later years, um, he, he made the comment to me that he had written that book as a call to arms for people to do that work of sharing the faith through imaginative literature. And I received it that way. I received it as a call to arms. I read that book and I thought, yes, this is it. This is the thing I want to be doing. Okay, got it. Um, and then discovered, okay, there are other people who are doing this. You know, Michael Ward is doing this, who ended up becoming my colleague at, um, at HBU in the Cultural Politics Program, where he still teaches. And, you know, Malcolm Wright's doing this. And, oh, there are other people doing this. And I, I now have a vocabulary and, a, and, a, and a, an approach to do this work. And so Apologetics and the Christian Imagination then came out of years of doing that work. Um, and it came primarily out of my teaching at HBU, you know, working with my students, helping them to understand this is how we're going to use the imagination to share the faith. Um, and then being able to say, okay, I should write this. I should write this up. I should write this so it can be <laughs> read by others than, than my students in my, in my classes. Hmm. Your story there rather reminds me of Lewis's when he describes in Surprised by Joy, Chesterton being the most sensible man in England, apart from his Christianity. He managed to bifurcate those for as long as he could, and then he eventually realized that he couldn't do that, but the one was clearly informing the other. And when you 
were describing what Tolkien and Lewis did for you, it reminded me of an experiment in criticism where Lewis is talking about books being a pair of spectacles that you put on. You get to look through somebody else's eyes. And this actually ties in with something that my wife and I will be doing at the Chesterton Conference in a couple of months, because we're going to be talking about how Chesterton and Lewis basically enable us to see see through other spectacles so we can get a sense of what a, a different worldview or a different way of looking at things, what that can what that can bring to our intellect when we can first of all see it and experience it. And I think that's so essential for really what imaginative apologetics is all about, because there's it's very easy to default to a kind of assertive intellectual mode of apologetics where I know something that's true, and it is true. I'm just going to tell you, this thing is true. Here's the syllogism. Yeah. And it's still true, but you can't get a grip on it. You can't grasp it. You, you, you literally can't figure out the meaning of it because you've got no, you've got no entry point. You've got no way in. Um, and that's something, um, I, I talk about this actually in, in the book, that's one of the reasons why so many conversations with people about the faith, we're just talking past each other. Because for instance, if I'm talking to somebody about the resurrection and they don't even believe in God, then if, we're, if I'm trying to convince them of the resurrection, that word to them is just a word. It's just a Christian jargony word. And so the whole conversation um, becomes what Michael Ward says in his, he's had this great essay um, um, on C.S. Lewis and imagination, the good serves the better and both the best. Um, it's a really excellent essay. But he talks about moving counters in a game, that it just becomes a, a moving these counters around like, oh, I make this move and you make that move. They're counters in an intellectual game. So whether you win or lose, you really haven't gone anywhere hmm. because it's just, it's just words. That, I think, is what happens a lot in intellectual debate. Um, people are just moving these counters, these intellectual counters. And if you lose a game of you know checkers, well, nothing happens. It's just a game. Mm. There's, there's no significance. The imaginative approach is trying to replace those counters with something that's real, something that matters, so that there's, there's investment in what we're saying. And of course, that's slower, and it's messier, and it doesn't lead to winning arguments. But that's good, <laughs> because we need to see this as a process, as a journey of seeing a vision and inviting people into it, not whacking them over the head, you know, with 10 reasons for such and such. It doesn't work. Um, and I think people who perceive those arguments as working and maybe have worked for them, it's because they, they've gotten to a point where they have one little obstacle that they mm. want to remove. And then the arguments remove the obstacle. And so the arguments serve a very good purpose. They, they, they're keys that unlock doors. But you have to want to unlock the door, right? So different things have different purposes. Um, and those arguments are hugely important. And I don't want to be perceived as dismissing that kind of factual or philosophical or historical kind of apologetics case. But they don't, they don't bring people into the faith by themselves. They, they're keys to unlock doors, but we have to, we have to show them there's something past that door they want to get to. Hmm. It's a tool, but like a hammer, if that's the only thing that you've got, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. And I'd also say disposition and personality type is also going to play a large part in that. If, if you are of the more philosophical, uh, you want to think about things r rigorously, that's going to appeal to you more. Whereas if, if you're not wired that way, somebody throwing a whole load of deductive arguments at you are just going to bounce off and make no impact. Now, just before you were talking about uh, jargon and words, and you spend quite a bit of your book talking about words themselves and the meaning that we attach to them. Why do you start there? Well, I, I start there because when we're trying to do dialogue, I mean, words are the foundation of what we're doing. And so much of, of what we try to do either you know, goes nowhere because we haven't attended to the words that we use. So it's kind of like, if we don't start off well, we will get nowhere at all. Um, and I found that this question of, of meaning 
is, I think, the most critical factor in effective evangelizing conversations, the most critical factor. Because so often, I have already alluded to this, when we have a conversation, we think we're disagreeing, but we're not talking about the same thing. Hmm. Or we think we're talking about something, but the words are just tokens. And this is a fundamental problem at, at the use of language. And if we don't resolve it at the point of language, then all our words are just noise. Um, and and they're, not, they're not just useless, they're worse than useless. Because if people just get a whole barrage of meaningless noise to them, then they're going to turn off. They're going to say, oh, well, I don't want to hear any more about that. And I've found that Christians can sometimes not realize what words mean or don't mean to other people. So to give one example, um, even amongst Christians, so this is not limited to dialogue with skeptics. This has a lot to do with you know, discipleship and formation as Christians. The word prayer. It has been my experience, especially working um, with like confirmation classes um, or people like that. Most people think prayer means intercession and answered prayer means I get what I asked for. Hmm. So if there's no other kind of prayer in their vocabulary and if they if they pray for something and they don't get it, then God does not exist because my prayer was left unanswered. Didn't work. And this, yeah, it didn't work. And this is is such a huge issue because it's directly related people leaving the faith. And I've had, I've had graduate students who told me, you know, their journeys of, of, of leaving the faith and then coming back. And so often it re re revolved around this issue. I prayed earnestly for my grandmother who was sick and then she died. And we see this in C.S. Lewis. He prays for his mother to get well and she doesn't. And that leads, if you, if you think that the word prayer means intercession, petition, request, and only that. And if you think that answered prayer only means you get what you want, that meaning actually will, will push you out of the faith if God responds in a different way than, than what, you, that, what you wanted. And so that question of meaning on that particular word is directly related to you know, people leaving the faith. Um, and so that's a pretty significant point, I think. Mm. And when I first started reading that section, the, the one that jumped into my, my head was God. Whenever I'm speaking to a, spe a skeptic about God, or they tell me they don't believe in God, the question I like to ask them is, tell me about this God you don't believe in. Because this I might not believe in him either. It, it, exactly. very, of very often, they end up describing maybe Thor or Zeus or one of the other Marvel superheroes. And Christians and Jews mean something quite different when they're talking about God. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a friend um, years ago that um, when I met her, I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist, but I believe in God. And not, not, a, not a native speaker, which was part of it, but by the Holy Spirit, I managed not to say anything like, what do you mean? That's contradictory. <laughs> okay, the Holy Spirit kept me not saying anything. And then I realized that that was her way of saying, like for her, atheist meant I don't belong to an organized religion. I don't, you know, I don't attend services, but she did have a faith in God. Um, and again, what does this word mean to that person? And actually she, she's now a Christian. Um, and, you know, over time, as she explored this, moving gradually closer to different understandings of these words, but I think about how quickly I could have shut down that conversation if I had leaped to a conclusion about what does that word mean and what do I need to do? Well, what I needed to do was listen, you know, just to be quiet and let her express herself and repeat, you know, over the years that same, <laughs> okay, let me just listen and then say, oh, well, this is what I understand by that word. This is what I understand by it. Oh, you know, and out of that came many fruitful conversations. Um, do we agree on everything? No, but. But being able to say, oh, well, what do you mean by that is, has helped a lot. And I think that, that simple question, what, what do you mean by that? Asked genuinely wanting to know, not as a trap. Oh, you got the wrong answer. But genuinely saying, oh, well, what, what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that word. What do you mean by the word God? Oh, okay, that's not quite what I mean by it. Uh, and that can really be be helpful in 
figuring out, well, where are we? What what do we need to talk about? We've been reading The Four Lives this season, and we have repeatedly quoted a part where Lewis says it is far easier to praise or dispraise than define and describe. And I, I think I think that's that's a lesson for all of us. Doesn't matter how how many how well you think this apologetics conversation is going, how well you think you're steering them down the path towards the conclusion you want them to reach. If you're talking about two different things, you're not going to end up where where you want to be. Now, in your book, you talk about metaphor and the necessity of poetic language, and you even end each chapter of the book with a poem. What was all that about? <laughs> well. The the poems came in because I realized that I had written an entire book about the importance of using the imagination and the arts, and I had written it in an entirely analytical mode. And I thought, <laughs> that won't do. <laughs> I have I, I have if I if I leave it as it is, I will have subverted my own argument because I've just made a case for the importance of this and then not done it. So I went back in and 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 either used poems I already written or wrote new poems, each one that reflects on the theme of that chapter in some way. And so um, I'm hopeful that readers of, of the book will take the poems as an opportunity to kind of practice the imaginative mode to say, okay, well, this poem has something to do with what she's just argued, but it's presenting it in a completely different mode. How can I, how can I sort of practice entering entering into that? That's the reason that the poems are there. And I've now forgotten the first part of your question. Well, before we get to that part, it reminded me of Mythopoeia, Tolkien's apologetic poetic response to Lewis. And I still find myself quoting little sections of that, like uh, we still make um, within the law with which we're made, and, and little lines like that. My second part of the question was about metaphor and the necessity of poetic language. Because we actually spoke a little bit about this earlier in the month when I spoke to apologist Peter S. Williams about verificationism and Lewis's essay, The Language of Religion. So we spoke a little bit about why poetic language is necessary. Um, but would you mind just filling out what you talk about in your book? Well, I think, you know, language has, has different modes and they're suitable for different things. And, and Lewis writes about this. And I think we can tend too quickly to, to sort of drop into the analytical mode for talking about things that go beyond analysis, that are experiential. So the experience, for instance, of being a human being, um, of existing, of being you, David, or me, Holly, it's not illogical. It's, it's not resisting logic or reason, but it's, it's more than that. So if we want to convey something, the experience of our, of our life we can't just give facts about like height, weight, age, you know, profession. Those will be true facts, um, but they will not convey anything really about who we are or what it's like to, to have our life. And language, poetic language, is a, is a mode of language that does better at that. It's able to convey meaning um, in, in different ways. And metaphor is the way I chose to focus on because metaphor is a comparative way of creating meaning. It compares two things that are not the same, but they have something in common, unexpected, that allows you to take that additional step forward meaning and say, oh, so it's like that. It takes you a bit further in, in a way that facts can't. And I think it's really vitally important to understand that metaphor also conveys meaning. It's it, metaphors can convey truth. They can convey falsehood. They are modes of communication. They're not. They're not like people don't think of like, oh, well, factual statements are true, and metaphors are are what like kind of opinion or or well, your truth or subjective. No, metaphors are just another way of, of conveying something um, and and a way of conveying truth. But we have to understand the mode that is in, and this I wanted particularly to underscore. Because when people talk about literal readings of the Bible, my, you know, sort of pedantic pet peeve reader goes off the charts <laughs> because, oh, those fundamentalists, they read the Bible literally. Well, what do you mean by literally? Um, and it turns out people need to know there are two meanings of the word literally. 
One of them is what people are usually thinking of, and they think of it as just taking it at face value. Um, so if I say, you know, um, well, raining cats and dogs, well, raining cats and dogs. Yes. Oh, well, if I were to take it literally, I'm looking outside to see if there's any kittens out there. There are no <laughs> kittens. You're a liar. You, you said it was raining cats and dogs, but where are the kittens? You know, you're a fundamentalist. You, you say meaningless statements. You're obviously some sort of religious bigot who can't use language properly, all that sort of stuff. And we get this, for instance, in um, people who will mock scripture by saying, oh, well, you know, there was a talking snake in the Garden of Eden um, and or or, well, things like that. Like, well, let's think about how is this language being used, whether or not there was a snake. It's to see if if we talk about images, we, we aren't immediately defaulting to well, if it's an image is therefore false. You can have poetic language that talks about things that's that are true things, like God in the Psalms saying, "You know, my mighty arm brought you out of Egypt." Well, we're not saying that God had biceps. Mm. You know, that's not the point. So there's a there's a flat reading of of literal language that has to be taken in context. If I say I'm drinking a cup of tea, that's a literal statement. It genuinely is a cup of tea. Raining cats and dogs, I could not take that literally in that sense. What we need to think about with the other meaning of the word literal is literal means the sense in which the author intended it. Mm -hmm. So when you say, if you were to say it's raining cats and dogs, what you literally mean is it's raining heavily. Mm -hmm. That's the sense that you intended. So if I take it that way, I have indeed taken it literally. So when we look at metaphor in scripture, we want to say, how does the author intend us to take it? And some of the things that look like metaphors to us are not. They're actually factual statements of quite remarkable things. Some of the things that look like metaphors are metaphors. And we need to understand what is the, what is the author intending us to convey by that. And this is a bit more work, um, but it allows us to actually understand what we're reading, which is helpful. And this is where poetic language is understanding poetry is so helpful. Because if you've been reading poetry all your life and you understand um, stories, you get this. You get that people use language in these ways. It's natural. Mm -hmm. So I actually think that the crisis of, of not understanding the Bible is related to people not reading poetry. It's just poetry yeah. for fun. Sorry, that opened up my, my pet thing. Oh, no, I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. Uh, I would say if they're not reading poetry or at the very least, they're, they are only reading nonfiction books. If they're not used to dealing with anything that from another genre, then they get very confused when they come across scripture. And Lewis actually has a really biting line in Mere Christianity uh, when people mock uh, some of the things that are said about heaven in scripture. And he basically says, if you can't understand it, you shouldn't read a book that's meant for grown-ups. Burn. <laughs> but yeah, but that's but that's exactly the point. Like if you if you don't grasp that this is intended to evoke and suggest and not not meant literally in the in the flat sense yeah you haven't you just haven't learned how to read because people can be illiterate in lots of ways they can be illiterate and not being able to read the words at all but they can also be illiterate in the sense of not being able to understand what they're reading beyond the most sort of flat basic level mm. i remember hearing somebody it's actually someone i went to school with um he saw a contradiction in scripture when it spoke about uh, someone being hung up on a tree and says, well, a tree isn't a cross. They're two different things. And I was just, were you asleep in our English class? I know we pretty much covered this. <laughs> the other thing that I thought of when you were talking about the two senses of literal, it's kind of ironic because today the word literal also doesn't mean literal. Somebody says, I literally died. No, 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 you didn't. That's not what that word means. Yes. And it's, it's really fun because in one sense you could say, oh, I literally died. I was so bored or whatever. Um, well, literally, it's not actually meaning literal because you are still speaking. But in the other sense of literally, you mm -hmm. can say, oh, well, it literally does mean what it says because they meant it to be taken that way. And then your mind kind of explodes and go um, <laughs> on. Yeah. Now, in your book, you actually draw a lot from a generally lesser-known inkling, Owen Barfield. And last season, we had a, a mini-series on his work. And he, 
I think he's stalking me. He, he, he keeps coming up in books where I don't expect him to ever be referenced. Uh, but what are some of his chief ideas that you that you draw on? Well, I wouldn't say that I draw a lot on him. Um, I think the most of the, the point that I take most strongly from him is the idea that uh, I think it's his line: the, the most effective way to um, to um, abort an idea is in the womb of language. If you want to kill an idea, you do it at the level of being able to talk about it. Um, and that, I think, is really the fundamental idea that I, I think I take from Barfield, this importance of language um, and really attending to it. What does it what does it mean? And if we if we don't get that right, we've, we've got nowhere. And I think a lot of what we see in terms of, of propaganda in, in the wider world um, is doing exactly that. It's murdering ideas in the womb by making it either impossible to talk about them or corrupting language with which we talk about them. And that, I think, doesn't get noticed as much as it ought to. Mm. I think a lot of people can be aware of the way that words are you know, put out of court. Well, we can't use that word anymore. It's insensitive or, or what have you. I will not, however, we have to be attentive because some words actually shouldn't be used because they are offensive. And we should think of that. It's not a question of, oh, if you say we shouldn't use a word, then therefore it's wrong. No, we have to think about what is the word and how we're using it. Hmm. So people tend to be relatively savvy about that, or at least aware of it, whether they agree or they disagree with, with how it's being handled. What I think is actually the more subtle and insidious threat is what I call verbicide, where words shift their meaning. Um, so we end up losing, just losing the meaning without knowing that we've lost it. And the, the most egregious example of this is the word sin, which in non-Christian usage does not mean, it's just to kind of to paraphrase the, uh, the, uh, the princess bride, this word does not mean what we think it means. <laughs> I mean, if you go into the, this, just, this just to say, use our literal phrase, this just kills me. I go into the grocery store and I see, you know, a display of chocolate cakes labeled sinfully delicious. Um, and like, well, what does that mean? I remember one time I was at a farmer's market and I saw a booth that said it was something like sinful bakery. And I was this close to walking up and saying, which sin exactly? Um, <laughs> theft, um, gluttony. Are you overcharging us? You know, I was this close, but I realized that they wouldn't, they wouldn't get what I was saying. So I, I, I did not. Um, so the word literally does not mean what Christians mean by sin. It means something kind of delicious and fun, which we feel vaguely guilty about. Um, and that has a huge impact on how we think about sin as Christians, because we can't not be influenced by that. Hmm. So now when we hear the pastor talk about sin, it doesn't hit us, I think, as strongly because we have been sort of conditioned that sin, you know, it's a word for like bad stuff, but you know, what kind of bad stuff? Like overindulging in chocolate or, you know, murder. <laughs> like, hmm. you know, what this word, you know, it, it has become very sort of very vague. Or another word that, that I am deeply disturbed by is, is the word porn and how hmm. that has become used uh, people will say like, oh, I was looking at some food porn, which they're looking at a, at a, a recipe book. Like, no, you, that is wrong on many levels. Because first of all, it, it sort of whitewashes the word porn, um, that this is a very bad thing. You shouldn't be looking at it. Because, oh, well, if recipes are the same thing as, you know, looking at people performing sex acts, then we've we've kind of diminished the one because recipes are okay so why not the other and it kind of legitimizes it and it desensitizes us to the concept and it also kind of blurs like well, why would we use this negative word to talk about a perfectly harmless activity mm -hmm. um, it's sort of the importation of the guilty thrill into something that's perfectly innocent like people talk about guilty pleasures and i think i would just advise every listener stop using that phrase just don't use the phrase guilty pleasures for innocent pastimes, because mm. if it really is a guilty pleasure, you should stop doing it. Um, and if it's an innocent pleasure, then don't feel guilty about it. 
So that phrase, guilty pleasures, is actually an example of verbicide. And it's it's corrosive because it it reduces our legitimate enjoyment of innocent, wholesome activities by making us feel vaguely like if we're enjoying it, maybe it's wrong. But it also slightly diminishes the importance of considering whether something really is wrong. Oh, it's a guilty pleasure, but I'm going to keep doing it anyway. Like it, it's corrosive on both on both sides. And this may seem like the most trivial kind of thing, but if it's that kind of usage that gets us to the point where we have things being advertised as sinfully good and people think that sin just means something fun. That's a problem. It's very Scrutapian. Absolutely. Their philology department was hard at work. And I hadn't realized until you just said it that, yes, it works on both ends. And that's why you get some Christians that think any kind of enjoyment or happiness, they've got to be doing something wrong. <laughs> Whereas Screwtape, uh, he points to God as being the source of all pleasures. And and that that's that, that was one of the things that Lewis really rehabilitated me on. The idea of, of pleasures and enjoyments can be good. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't have to be, and again, here's another word that has very much shifted its meaning. We don't have to be Puritan. Exactly. Now, another point that you make in your book is about making apologetics incarnational. What did you mean by that? Well, by that, I mean um, trying to make it, well, embodied is another way of saying incarnational, trying to bring things down to the level of the specific and the concrete. Um, and again, Lewis is really good about, about this. Uh, I mean, this is what he does in the Narnia Chronicles, for instance. Um, there's the idea of the cosmic Christ about whom we can make philosophical statements, theological statements. Um, and then he, he incarnates that in Aslan. And we see Aslan, you know, being jovial, being martial, you know, living out these different aspects of Christ likeness. That's, that's embodying Christ. And so we do, of course, we need abstract theological language because that's how we get precision. That's how we get things like creeds, where we need to be clear what is true, what isn't true, where are the areas that we can get muddled on. That's vitally important. But how do we how do we take that in? How do we assimilate that as meaning? Well, we need to have it made concrete, made specific, put into you know, descriptions and encounters and people and situations. And that's how we're going to understand what it is that we're, that we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where stories work so well. Well, this is, this is exactly where I was going. And in your book, you say that, well, that's been your bread and butter. So that's the, that's the specific avenue that you're, that you're going to talk about um, as well as stories. Would you just include all of the arts along with that, helping something become incarnational? Yes, absolutely. And I and I said that, you know, I, I wouldn't want to come across as saying that stories are the only way. I I will say I do think they're a privileged way because we we know from scripture that God, you know, Jesus is the word made flesh. Um and so language has, I think, a privileged place because of the way that God chose to make his self-revelation in his son. But that said, um, you know, language is my thing. It's what I do. Stories are what I do. So that's what I'm talking about. But the visual arts, for instance, are able to be actually more fully incarnational because literally if we're watching a film or a television show, we're seeing literally embodied stories, actors and actresses, you know, carrying out the story. So film and television are profound modes of conveying this incarnational expression of the truth. Um, the visual arts, painting, you know, stained glass. There's a reason why, you know, stained, as soon as Christians could come out of the catacombs, they, they made art, they made paintings, they made, even in the catacombs, um, they made art depicting the faith because that conveys the truth in a very powerful way. Statues, um, this is really important. And even, this is something I feel quite strongly about, architecture is very, very important because the buildings that we live in say something about what we believe is true. Mm. And I think it's not insignificant that, you know, the 20th century, which saw the rise of, you know, atheism and mass slaughter and all these horrors also saw the rise of brutalism in architecture. 
I don't think this is a coincidence because that whole approach really tries to deny human experience and human preferences. You know, the architect, I mean, I'm quite sure they are working out interesting conceptual things. I'm less convinced. But they're Karen. not. Yeah, I'll, I'll give them that. Like they're working. <laughs> yeah, they have interesting ideas. They're, but, but they're not thinking about who actually needs to live in these buildings and what that experience is like. And that is even explicitly trivialized. Oh, people like decorations in their buildings. How quaint. We're going to deny that because we want them to live in this, you know, sterile modernist thing that they're creating. Um, but I think to myself, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Oxford. What are the buildings that people take pictures of? Well, they're not the modernist ones. No. Um, and, and there's some, oh, there's some horrors, including some new ones, which is just <laughs> dreadful. Um, but people take pictures of the Radcliffe camera. They take pictures of the Sheldonian theater. They take pictures of buildings that were built with harmony and proportion and interesting details because the people liked that. It's pleasing to the eye. It was pleasing to the eye then. It's pleasing to the eye now. You go into, say, the Bodleian Library to study, as I have so many times, and the very rooms give you a feeling of beauty, of contentment, of of goodness, of here I am in this wonderful space, as opposed to these libraries that are, you know, concrete tanks with, you know, books in them. <laughs> so architecture says something, and the architecture, particularly of our churches, says something about what we believe about God. So having a beautiful church is actually a really profound statement about what we believe. And one last point, this is a, a bit of a sort of a hobby horse of mine, it's also profoundly egalitarian. So I know people will say, well, all the money you spend on beautiful churches, why don't you give it to the poor? That is a kind of statement that is only made by people who have money, who can afford to have beautiful things in their private homes. Hmm. The poor, when they're given the chance, build beautiful cathedrals. They each chip in their tiny bit and they build beautiful cathedrals, which are then accessible to everyone for free. Everybody, regardless of whether they are the, the homeless guy or the millionaire, has absolutely equal access to walk into a beautiful cathedral and be in the presence of, of this expression of who God is. Um, it's profoundly leveling precisely because of its great beauty. And that is something that is a gift to those who don't have the resources to have that beauty in their own homes. So who are we to say, well, I, who can have beauty in my own home, I'm going to deny you the one place you can have beauty because I think that you ought to be given you know, a sandwich instead. Now, we ought to also feed people. This is not an either or. But that expression of beauty in a public space is really a profound statement about really valuing each, each individual human being, which is part of what we believe. I think it's significant that in the first of the Screwtape letters, when Screwtape is recounting somebody who very nearly starts thinking dangerous thoughts about God. All of that takes place inside a beautiful building. And what does he do? He has to rush him out, get him out into the street, get him to see a bus, uh, somebody selling a paper. Yeah, noise, distractions. Yeah. And, and the next time you're in England, if you want to laugh, go to Bristol Cathedral. I think it was Bristol. Uh, I went there and they had an award from the Cement Foundation. And that just tells you everything you need to know about how that church looks. And you, you compare that with uh, the writings of when Vladimir sent his emissaries out across the, uh, across the globe to find a religion for his new country. And uh, they came back from Constantinople uh, and they went to the Hagia Sophia and they said, we didn't know if we were on earth or in heaven. Yeah. And so that's true for, for, for literature, for art and for music and all of the arts in general. Well, time is rushing away. Um, you have lots of other things that you talk about in your book. You talk about doubt, suffering. Um, you talk about, there's an excellent chapter on longing. And we covered a little bit of that when we spoke in this month about the argument from desire. You also talk about the limitations uh, of these approaches. But to sort of put a bow on everything, what would you say is your goal with this book? What are you hoping for in your readers? Well, I think it really is conveyed in the subtitle an integrated approach to defending the faith, because we need both. We need reason and imagination. And I emphasize the imagination in my work because it's what I can do. And also because I feel that that has been undervalued. 
But what we really need is people to understand that it's not, I do one or the other, or, or one is more important than the other. We really need, we need clear thinkers who can also express themselves imaginatively. And we need imaginative artists who are also clear thinkers. Mm. Um, we need both of those things. And it is possible to have that. Uh, it truly is. But we, we have to recognize that it's a value and move, move towards it. And that whole idea of integration, really, if you ask any of my students that I had um, at HBU, it really informed and informs my work because it's, if you take that more broadly, it's not just, you know, reason and imagination. It's also, what do we do with our emotions? Where's that place in it? Um, what do we do with our bodies? How do we act towards each other? Um, the whole incarnational witness of our lives. So this, to have a truly integrated approach is to say, we have to include everything that makes us human. Mm -hmm. And some of us have particular callings to do certain parts of it. But I think that everybody should always be thinking about the whole when they take any particular approach. Dr. Holly Ordway, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. As our landlord rings the bell for the last call, can you please tell our listeners where they can go to find out more about you and pick up a copy of your book, Apologetics and the Christian Imagination, An Integrated Approach to Defending the Faith? Well, they can go to my website, hollyordway.com, and that has a page that lists all of my books um, and my various videos and other writings. So I would, uh, I would send them over there. And this book is also on audiobook. I was very delighted to see because... Alexander has been cutting teeth. I'm very pleased to say they are now, his, his six are now fully out. So his sleeping is getting better. But um, I didn't have a whole lot of time to sit around reading books for a while. Uh, so it was really nice to put on an audio book um, and play with him and, uh, and learn about uh, imaginative apologetics uh, as, as we were uh, on, the, uh, as we were on the, the kangaroo bouncer that he absolutely adores. <laughs> Excellent. I approve. Well, thanks again to Dr. Ordway for coming on the show. Listeners, a quick announcement before I wrap up the episode. You've heard a lot of me for the last couple of months, but you're not going to hear from me now until July. We will be having episodes in June, but it's going to be Matt and Andrew doing all of the hosting as they work through a book called A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Van Orkin. And as they go through it, you'll understand why we picked to go through this book in conjunction with the season where we are going through The Four Loves. I'm going to use that time. I will be busy. I will be doing stuff for the podcast. There's a bunch of website updates that need to happen. And also I'm going to be working on another project, my book about the four loves. But as always, thanks for lending us your ears for an hour. Thanks to all of those of you who support us on Patreon, to our top tier supporters, Deborah, number one, Marvin, Joelle, Thomas, Deborah, number two, Anonymous, Bill and Joanna Snort, Bud Shane, John, Kevin, Brian K, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. And please join us next episode when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>